Um, today's theme is focusing really more on decision making, integ integrative uh, decision making, um, with, a, with a genetic and um, a computational focus. And, and it's my real pleasure today to introduce our first uh, speaker, who is Yael uh, Neith. And Yael um, really has a background um, um, based in, in Israel, but also more recently in computational neuroscience in UCL in London. Uh, Yael um, is, the, is a professor now at Princeton Neuroscience Institute and the Psychology Department. And I've known Yael for the, about the last couple of years, and I can say that she really does bring an incredibly innovative mix of computational ideas as well as a grounding in clinical neuroscience. Um, she's won several awards, and I'm just going to highlight a, a few of them. She, she won the National Academy of Sciences Trollin Research Award in Experimental Psychology and was also the recipient of a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Uh, she was also the Ellison Medical Foundation Scholar. So as I was saying earlier, her, her work really is at the cutting edge between um, clinical neuroscience and computational techniques. And today she's going to come and tell us about learning and decision making across healthy and disease states. So it's my pleasure to ask Yale to come to the stage and thank you for coming, Yale. So first I'd like to thank um, the program committee and especially Mary for inviting me to speak here. It's an incredible honor to present my lab's work here today. So as Mary said today, I'm going to talk about decision making and specifically I'm going to talk about trial and error learning. And when we think of traditional learning and decision making tasks, especially in the lab, you might think of um, whether to press a lever or not based on a stimulus such as a light, or you might think of deciding where to go based on location and space. And we now, after several decades of studying these kinds of behaviors computationally, neurally, and behaviorally, uh, we have a well-worked-out story for how this kind of learning occurs in the brain. So the idea is that in each state of the world, so for instance, a certain location or the state of the light being on or being off, we learn the values for different actions. So which action will lead to reward, which won't lead to reward, and we learn that using our basal ganglia. So specifically, the idea is that whenever we perform an action and we get an unexpected outcome, dopamine neurons in the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra pars compacta calculate the amount of surprise, so the prediction error. And that prediction error trains value learning in the stratum. And there's also a lot of work uh, recently in computational psychiatry looking at how these prediction errors affect anything from memory, to, uh, well, memory, learning, attention, and how that relates to diseases such as, um, such as mood disorders and depression. But I'm not going to talk about that today um, because this is not really what decision making and learning in the real world looks like. So think of this mundane task that you probably perform regularly of crossing the street. So this is decision making. You have to decide whether to cross the street or to wait. So it's a go, no go task. But the situation here is very different from what I described before because the scene is very cluttered. So, the, so if you ask yourself, what is the stimulus here? The answer is not really clear. Is it the shops across the street? Is it the people um, on, the, on the pavement, et cetera? So we've already learned that the dimensions of the environment that are relevant to this task are very few. So maybe the time left on the pedestrian light and the speed and the distance of any car that's approaching. So we can ignore most of the scene and represent the task in our mind as comprised of only a few features of the environment. And this representation is very task specific. So if instead of wanting to cross the street, you wanted to stop a taxi, then you would represent other things. You would represent the colors of the cars and not necessarily their speed. So I'm going to talk today about this idea of how do we represent a task so that it's very efficient not only to make decisions, so if I don't have to process everything in front of me, I can decide the go, no, go more quickly, but also for proper learning. So if I represented everything and made my decision about everything, I would also learn about everything. So that means if I start crossing the street and a car honks at me, 
I would then learn that in this specific situation with that white bus parked in front of me and at the, at the turn of the road, et cetera, that's when I should not cross the street. But that's not what we want to learn from this, right? We want our learning to be much more general. So if we have a task that ignores most of the irrelevant specifics, we can generalize our learning to other street crossings and to other situations. And you know, we won't take 10,000 trials to learn to cross the street and get run over in the meantime. So the question is, how do we learn a task representation for each specific task that will allow us to make uh, decisions efficiently and to learn efficiently? Going back to the neural picture, what we know about these dopamine signals is what they actually do is they don't um, change synapses directly. They modulate learning by impacting on plasticity and corticostriatal synapses. So what we're really asking is these corticostriatal projections, they bring afferents from all over the cortex and stratum. So the question is, how does the brain subselect which of these, which cort what cortical information to send to the stratum uh, to be learned about? Okay, so to study this in the lab, uh, we devised a task, uh, Yuan Changliang, who is then a research assistant in my lab, and just recently, it's like three days ago or a week ago, graduated from Stanford, um, and Angela Radulescu, who's a graduate student in my lab, they designed a task that was supposed to mimic the street crossing example in a, you, you'll see, no, no streets, no, no cars were involved. Uh, here's the idea. Um, so subjects, human subjects, uh, see three stimuli like these. Each column is a stimulus. And uh, for each, each stimulus has three features, a house, well, a building, a face, and a tool. And, what they, and so there are these three dimensions, tool dimensions, house dimensions, and face dimensions. And what we tell subjects is that only one of these dimensions is relevant for determining reward. So they have to choose stimuli, which have all three dimensions in them. But they know two of them they can ignore, and only one dimension they need to pay attention to. Um, and in that dimension, we tell them that one feature, let's say the screwdriver, but well, we don't tell them which. One, one feature is going to reward them 75% of the time if they choose a stimulus that includes it, and the other stimuli, are go the other features are going to reward with 25% of the time. So what people need to do is learn at the same time what to ignore, what to uh, take into account, and in that dimension, what is the most rewarding feature. And we don't give them too much time to do that, so every 25 trials, we tell them game over, new game starts, the, uh, with a new relevant dimension and new target feature. So we have lots of learning curves, and we're trying to see how do people learn this task. So to give you a feel for the task, um, let's, let's play one game together. Well, I'm going to play it. You're going to uh, observe me as the, as the subject. OK, so let's start. So I don't know anything, so let's choose left. Didn't work. Let's choose left again. OK. Let's try Clooney again. Go Clooney. Hmm. So for, don't forget, it's probabilistic. So only 75%. OK, but this is starting to look like bad luck. It must be on the wrong track. So I'll start over. OK, maybe Taj Mahal, maybe the ranch. Oh, there they are both again. What should I choose? Let's do Taj Mahal, yes. Okay, so this was a shorter game, and of course I know it by heart, but um, that's how the task works. And how do our subjects fare on the task? So they do well, they learn over time. So what I'm showing you here is throughout the game, what's a fraction of choices that they make of the correct, the, the most rewarding uh, feature, so the one that gives rewards 75% of the time, and you can see that they start from chance, so 33%, and they improve um, throughout the task. They don't get to 100%, and that's because they don't learn all of the games. So some games, at the end of the game, they totally know what's going on, and they choose the right thing again and again, and some games, they're still in the dark. Um, so, so the question was, how do our participants learn the task? And over the years, we've built many models, computational models of this task, and done a lot of formal model comparison to test different hypotheses. And I'm not going to take you through all that. I'm just going to tell you that now we feel pretty confident that 
we know what participants are not doing. So um, they're not doing simple reinforcement learning where basically you see a stimulus with all its three dimensions and if you got reward you choose that configuration again and if uh, you don't get reward, you tend to not choose that configuration again. So we didn't think they would be doing that, and they don't do that. They, they know from the instructions that the whole configuration of three features is not the relevant thing to, to work with here. Um, they're also not Bayesian ideal observers. So in this task, uh, you can solve it Bayes optimal, but that's not what people do. Um, actually, a Bayes optimal observer would learn faster than humans here. And they also don't do serial hypothesis testing. So the way I was, uh, the strategy I was vocalizing as I played the task was kind of hypothesis testing. Should I test this hypothesis? Okay, I must be on the wrong track. Let me try another hypothesis. That doesn't seem to be exactly what people are doing, even though that's what I was saying. Um, instead, our evidence indicates that what participants are doing is they're learning the task using something that we call attention-weighted reinforcement learning. So, to explain attention-weighted reinforcement learning, I first need to explain how we measured attention in this task. And maybe when you were watching me play the game, you might have felt that at different times you were paying more or less attention to, say, the faces or, uh, or the, the buildings. So to measure this, we used non-invasive eye tracking. So we divided the screen into top, middle, and bottom, and counted on each trial what proportion of the time participants' eye gaze was in each section of the screen. So this gives us, for each trial, a measure of how much attention they're, um, they're overtly directing to faces, tools, and houses. So the trial that you see um, on top here, do you see my mouse? No? No, I don't think you see my mouse. Uh, the trial that you see um, on top is the one that's highlighted in the bottom as well. Okay, so that was one measure. Um, the second measure, and that's why we uh, we use faces, houses, and tools, so we di it didn't depend on eye measurements. We used the fact that um, we did this, the participants were in the fMRI scanner, so we can look at areas in their visual cortex that are differently sensitive to faces, tools, and houses, and read out their covert attention. So for this, we used multivoxel pattern analysis. So the idea is to look at small groups of neurons um, and measure their activation levels when we know what the subject is attending to. So we had a separate pre-task where we directed subjects' attention to different dimensions at different times. So we told them attend to houses, attend to faces. This was a one-back task. Um, and so we can measure for each of these trials where we know what they're attending to, what different voxels are doing. So for instance, I'm showing here two voxels, and you can see that voxel one is more active when there's attention to houses than to buildings than to um, faces and tools, and voxel 2 is more active for faces than to uh, buildings and tools. So overall, with these two voxels and this toy example, I could build a classifier that will separate the trials very well into the three dimensions. Of course, we have many more voxels than this, so we can use these classifiers that we train on this pre-task to then classify during the task what subjects are attending to. And here we have a trial by trial readout again of their attention. And, um, and now we can use these two measures of attention together to modulate reinforcement learning. So the idea here is in reinforcement learning we talk about values of different stimuli or values of different actions. So let's say I want to calculate the value of this stimulus of uh, Clooney, the screwdriver, and uh, Notre Dame before it burnt down. Um, and so that would be the sum of the values of each of the features in our model. But we, we know what they're attending to, so we use that attention. For instance, if they're attending more to faces and less to tools, then we, um, this is, we, we use a weighted sum rather than a regular sum so that uh, the value of Clooney uh, takes more, uh, influences the value of this stimulus more than the value of the screwdriver. So we do that um, for each of our, uh, each of the three stimuli on the screen. And so let's say we get these numbers, 0 0.7, 0 0.2, and 0.3 as the values, and then we assume that people choose, uh, tend to choose things with higher values. So let's say they choose, well, I chose Clooney when I was playing the task. And now we can calculate a prediction error, which is the outcome, in this case, a reward of one point. Um, 
and uh, minus the value, the expected value of the stimulus. And, uh, and then in learning, in, in regular reinforcement learning, we take that prediction error and we modify the values of the different features based on that. So if the prediction error is positive, we'll increase the values of the three features here, Clooney, um, uh, screwdriver and Notre Dame, and if it's negative, then we'll decrease the values. But here again, we bias that by attention. So we increase most the value of the feature that people were attending most to, and, and less uh, the features that they were attending less to. So we did a lot of model comparisons with lots of different other models, and they supported this model as the best explanation for choice behavior in this task. So now, as I said, subjects were in the scanner, so we can ask, is there neural evidence for this model? And um, so what we did here is we looked at brain areas that correlate with the values computed by our model, and we know that we're expecting these correlations in ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Um, so that's an area where lots of studies have showed activity that correlates with the value of the chosen stimulus. But what we're asking is, what areas in the brain are significantly better correlated with values that are calculated by the model that's biased by attention as compared to values that are calculated without the attention bias. So we have kind of both of these regressors in our design and we ask where in the brain does the attention contribute most to value computation and you can see that we indeed get that in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, um, which is reassuring because that's where we expected the values to be calculated. And we can ask specifically about the contribution of attention biasing calculation of values and attention biasing learning, and um, both of these contributions are seen as well significantly in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And we can do the same for the prediction errors. We can ask in which area in the brain are the prediction errors calculated based on values calculated with attention uh, significantly better explaining brain activity than prediction errors that are calculated without attention, and again, we get the ventral, we get the, um, the nucleus accumbens or uh, uh, ventral stratum, which is the area that numerous studies have shown prediction errors in. So, um, so this this all makes us happy. Um, and the last thing we can do is we can ask, okay, if, if we look at this attention trial by trial. Um, there are specific trials where you can see here one trial, trial 15, where there was most attention to houses, and the next trial, attention switched to be mostly to faces. So we can ask what areas in the brain are responsible for these switches, so they're more active in these situations than, for instance, when uh, attention um, does not switch from trial to trial. And here we get um, a variety of areas that are more active in these switch trials. We get dorsolateral prefrontal cortex bilaterally, we get intraparietal sulcus bila bilaterally, precuneus, and pre-SMA, which are basically the classic attention control network. So that's where the name comes from, attention, um, attention modulated reinforcement learning. So the idea is that attention shapes the cortical inputs to the stratum as we are learning. Okay, so in reinforcement learning, there's a concept called the curse of dimensionality. So the idea is that the more dimensions the environment has, the more combinations of features or states we have to learn values for, and that just makes learning prohibitively expensive in terms of the amount of experience that we need in order to truly master a task. What I mentioned before, we don't want to need 10,000 trials of crossing the street in order to learn how to solve it. So we know that it only takes us several trials to learn uh, new tasks and to learn, for instance, to cross the street. Uh, maybe there our parents helped us, et cetera, but did our parents tell us, you know, when you're trying to hail a cab, pay attention to the color? They, they might have not told us all of these. So we can learn very quickly how to solve new tasks. And the idea that I'm trying to put forth here is that attention is what solves the curse of dimensionality here. It lets us home in on the relevant features and ignore the irrelevant features so we can generalize over them and um, make the task have less dimensions and less curse of dimensionality. So in terms of basic science here, um, I like to think of attention and selective attention not as a constraint 
on processing. It's not that, oh, you know, we wish we could have attended to everything, but we have this attention spotlight that's very limited, but it's actually a feature of learning. It allows optimal generalization and efficient learning. But this, it turns out that this is only half of the story. So some of the important parts of a task are not things that we see and have to kind of pull out from all the stuff that we have to ignore, but maybe they're unobserved. So imagine you see this. So uh, this is uh, a person jaywalking on a four-lane street with the, the stops, the, the light is saying stop, um, and they're not, they're not even in a big hurry. So you might learn, okay, so I can jaywalk without worry on really wide roads. Um, and you can start learning a new policy uh, of jaywalking instead of using the light. But here you have to be really careful and not generalize too widely. So that picture was in New York where I used to live. Um, but now this year I'm in Tel Aviv for a sabbatical. And in Tel Aviv, people are really not that forgiving. So although the streets and the cars and the shops look remarkably similar in both cities, actually if there are any Israelis here from uh, the East Coast, we usually by mistake call New York City Tel Aviv. Uh, <laughs> so they're very similar, but you should learn separately and represent separately the tasks of crossing the street in Tel Aviv and crossing the street in New York City. So one way to think about this is that, in general, all of learning is generalization. So no two situations are ever going to be exactly alike. And you have to use the statistics of the task and the rewards in the tasks, et cetera, to infer whether two seemingly uh, similar situations are really the same thing. So you can take learning from one situation to decision making on, on the other situation, or they're different enough. They're in two different contexts. So we think of these um, representations, these circles here, these task states as clusters of events. So I take many events and I deem them similar enough to allow generalization across them and so I call them all the same state and some events are a different state. So let me convince you that people indeed parse their learning in this way based on what is similar and what is different. So here what we want to do is test the hypothesis that similarity determines boundaries on our generalization in learning. So to do this, Sam Gershman, who was then a graduate student in my lab and is now faculty at Harvard, uh, he presented subjects with uh, this kind of display, so circles on a screen and ask them, it was a really, oh, you can barely see those, uh, ask them to say quickly how many circles they saw. And it wasn't such a perceptually demanding task as it might be for you here. Uh, but we wanted them to do it quickly so they don't actually have time to count, they're just guessing. And so you can guess what the number is here. Does anybody want to call it out? 30, 40, well, and then we gave them the exact number. We said there were 39 circles. And here's another trial, guess. Okay, um, so here, I think, I think I don't have the next, I don't have the actual number in my slides, it's 70 something. So that was a task, and people did many, many trials of this. And um, we weren't interested in their ability to count quickly, rather we wanted to, to see them learning from the correct feedback to approximate the number of circles, because the number of circles came from a Gaussian with some mean, and they wa we wanted to see how they learned the mean. But importantly, the trials came in two flavors. So as you saw, sometimes all the circles were red and sometimes they were all yellow. So we didn't say anything about color to the subjects, but color did determine the mean number of circles. Um, so in fact, there were two conditions in this experiment. In one condition, one color of the circles, let's call them the yellow circles, uh, had a mean of 65 circles per trial and the other color red had a mean of 35. But in another condition, in another block, so these were in blocks, within subjects, the two colors would have, the, it, they would be two different colors in that case. They weren't always yellow and red. They could be green, blue, etc. But for simplicity, I'll call them all yellow and red. So the yellow is still six, mean 65. So in both conditions, one of the colors is mean 65. But now the other color is mean 55. And so our hypothesis was that because of the similar statistics in condition two, subjects would basically ignore color. They would learn the overall mean, which is 60, 
and that, that would be what they would guess. Whereas in condition one, because the statistics of the two colors are different enough, they would not ignore color. They would use color as a cue to, to uh, segment what they generalize across, and they would learn separately the uh, mean for the yellow and the mean for the red circles. And so if we compare their guesses only on the yellow trials, which are identical in both conditions because they're mean 65, we expect them to be more accurate in condition one because they're learning about yellow separately than in condition two where they're merging yellow and red in their learning. And indeed, that's what we saw. And we replicated this in several experiments. So 65 is, is more accurate here for condition two. And you can see that, uh, for, sorry, for the yellow circles. And you can see that in condition one, they're closer to 65. In condition two, they're closer to 60, which is the overall mean. So basically what I'm saying is, what I'm suggesting is that people automatically and implicitly, they're not necessarily aware of this. We have uh, funny conversations with subjects who later said, oh, I didn't even notice there were colors. Um, so they automatically and implicitly infer whether, for instance, all the trials are due to one, um, one distribution, which I can call one hidden cause that causes all one latent cause uh, for all these stimuli, or um, there are two latent causes, one that causes the red stimuli, one that causes the yellow stimuli. So we're thinking of this as in, real, in the real world, we uh, basically we're bombarded with information all the time. So bits of experience are impinging on us, and we have to cluster them together as these are similar, they come from one latent cause, and these are different, they come from another latent cause. So these latent causes or these states um, are clusters of similar stimuli, and learning happens within a cluster and not across cluster boundaries. So we see this in learning, but more than that, I'm going to argue that this inferred structure of the world, how many causes, this is a causal structure, what causes the stimuli that I see, what hidden things cause the stimuli that I see. So I think that this inferred structure of the world is also how humans organize our internal representations of events in memory. So our memory reflects how we believe the world is um, clustered. And um, to show this, Sam Gershman and together with Angela Radulescu read the following experiment also on humans. So they asked people to memorize a series of line segments. So this was done on undergraduates and to coax undergraduate study subjects to pay attention to boring line segments, they, we asked them first to try to predict the line, so they would draw a line with, with the mouse, and then we showed them the correct line, uh, together with points that reflected how close their prediction was to reality. And from trial to trial, the line would change a little bit in its length and in its orientation, and so they could see that. So here's the next trial, they predict the next line, and then they see the actual line. And um, what you see on the bottom of the screen is a little ball that indicates the current trial in the block of trial. So that ball advances from trial to trial. So let's jump to the end of the block. So here's the last trial, predict the next line. Here's the prediction, here's the line. Okay, so now the trick was that after the block ended, we asked subjects to try to reconstruct from memory one of the lines that they saw at the very beginning of the block. So um, this is not easy, and, but they, they could do, you know, they reconstructed something, they drew something with the mouse. And here behind the scenes, so what I'm showing you here is for every trial in a block, every trial here is a, is a circle on this graph, on the x-axis you see the length of the line on that trial, and on the y-axis you see the orientation of the line, and you can see that they changed uh, very little from trial to trial um, in a kind of random walk with no returns. So that's what we call gradual change block, but like in the circles experiment here, also there were two types of blocks. Uh, there was the gradual change blocks, and um, there were blocks that looked like this, where in the middle of the block there would be one bigger change, so four times as big as normal and we call this a jump. And again, like previously, our hypothesis, but now about memory, was that in the gradual blocks, because um, 
because the stimuli are very similar trial to trial, they would all be put together in one big kind of memory trace. And so they would basically interfere with each other in memory. Whereas in the jump condition, we expected that the first memory, the memory of the first stimuli in the block would be separated from the memory trace of the post-jump stimuli because they changed so much. Suddenly, you know, the line is much longer and a completely different orientation. And so in this case, the stimuli and the, the memory of the stimuli in the beginning of the block would be more protected. And so we expect people to be more accurate in reconstructing from memory a stimulus from the beginning of the block, um, have less interference. So when we model this, basically, what we see in our model is that in the jump blocks, it infers that there are two latent causes on average, uh, and in the gradual blocks, it infers only one latent cause. So in reality, what happens is subjects will uh, generate some line from memory, so it has a length and an orientation, orientation, and we can measure the distance between that line and the what, what they're trying to uh, reconstruct, so the beginning of the block, and we want that distance to be as small as possible. That, that means they're accurate. And we can measure the distance from the end of the block, and we want that distance to be as big as possible because that means that there's less interference of later stimuli with that memory. And so what you see here is that indeed in the jump condition, the distance from the start was smaller and the distance from the end was larger than in the gradual condition. So um, this was basically our prediction. So to summarize, what I've told you so far is I suggested that as bits of experience impinge on us, we cluster experiences together into task states based on similarity. And attention allows us to gloss over some dimensions in this process. When we determine similarity, we determine similarity based on what's relevant, not what's not relevant to the task. And then learning happens within a cluster and not across cluster borders, and that basically determines our generalization. So I titled my talk, Learning and Decision Making in Health and Disease, and the end disease was kind of in parentheses. Uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is how can we relate this process or this framework to mental health? And I thought a lot about, um, so I'm a newcomer to computational psychiatry, and I thought a lot about what to talk about um, in this talk. And instead of talking about um, Instead of talking about work that's in progress in my lab, I decided to talk about work that we haven't started yet, really, that we've just thought about to, to you know, help, maybe you can help us think about this. So, um, so to describe this work, believe it or not, first I have to show you a little bit of the behind the scenes of how we model this behavior, that, the computational model. And so the idea here is that people infer from their observations what cluster or latent cause each stimulus or trial belongs to using something called Bayesian inference with an infinite capacity prior, which is also kind of called a Chinese restaurant process prior, for those who uh, want to know these names, this is a Chinese restaurant with, with Bayes and Pavlov sitting there. So um, the idea is that we have a generative model, so a model of how experiences are generated in the world, and the idea in the model is that observed events, trials in our experiments, are caused by these latent causes, and in particular, our, we have a prior assumption that um, there are a few latent causes in the environment. So a latent cause that has recently caused many observations is more likely to cause the next observation, all else equal. Um, but we don't want to limit ourselves to only causes that we've already seen observations from, so there's also always a small chance that a new latent cause is going to cause the next observation. So the number of possible latent causes or clusters is unbounded in this model. That's, that's where the name comes from, an infinite capacity prior. And then we have uh, the, what's called, so that was the prior, and the likelihood in this Bayesian inference process is that each latent cause tends to cause observations that look, sim tends to produce observations that look similar to each other. So we can basically use similarity to infer uh, what what, what latent cause each stimulus came from. So this is the model. I'm not showing you the equation. Actually, there's only one equation, really. But, I, uh, but what you need to know here is that there are several parameters for the model. And the parameters, there are three parameters. One alpha tells us basically the probability of the person inferring that a new latent cause uh, is in effect. 
The second one, tau, is the time constant, kind of how long in history am I, how long am I expecting a latent cause to be active, which is how long in history should I look at the previous stimuli to infer what's going on with this stimulus that I'm seeing. And the last one, mu, is a size prior. It's kind of how big, how variable do I expect um, the stimuli from one latent cause to be, very variable or very similar to each other. And so the idea is that we can try to measure these parameters in different people and see if they correlate to dimensions of mental illness. And so to do this, we designed a new task that we, are, um, that we are, have not run in patients yet, only in healthy subjects, and, and uh, this is ongoing. And this is a task. So um, people see on each trial a microbe. This microbe has spikes. And these spikes, there could be lots of spikes, as you can see in some of these, or there could be fewer spikes, and they could be long spikes or short spikes. And so um, the physicians in the room will have to forgive me, but we fondly call this task Place the Plague. <laughs> and that's because um, what we tell participants is that there was a microbiologist who went and took pictures of different uh, microbes at different locations. So here you can see, and each location has kind of its characteristic microbes. So you can see here that uh, in the wild, in the, in the forest, the microbes have uh, lots of spikes, whereas in the desert there um, on the bottom left, the microbes have fewer spikes and they're shorter, and so each each location has uh, my different kinds of microbes. And what participants do is over the task, they see microbe after microbe, and they have to classify where they think these microbes came from. And we tell them that these, you know, these are photos, and they weren't labeled, and they have to help us by labeling the photos, and some of them might have fallen out of order. So overall, what we have is we show them a bunch of microbes from, let's say, location A, and then after a while, there's um, a jump to location B, and this is all well controlled in that we go from you know, trial 12 to trial 13 are both in, uh, in location A, but they're far apart, and the same distance to trial 14 in location B, but location B is, is the, uh, trial 14 is different from everything they've seen before, so we're expecting them to start to say, this is a new location. They start a new cluster. And we want to do this in the scanner and also behaviorally and look at what happens in the brain and what happens uh, uh, what happens in the brain when people start a new cluster, what happens when people jump back to an old cluster. So this is, you know, a highly structured task. Uh, but behaviorally, we can also see individual differences here. So for each subject, based on their behavior in this task, we do many blocks of this task, we can quantify the different parameters. And so what I'm showing you here is simulations, not, not subjects. Um, simulations of behavior in this task coming from different sets of parameters. So for instance, in, uh, in panel A at the top left, what you see here is people who have a small size prior, so they assume that clusters uh, are, make very similar stimuli, and a low concentration parameter, so they, are, so they assume, uh, so they have a low probability of starting a new cluster. And you see here that um, these simulated participants would generate um, a medium number of causes, so more is about eight, so that's in the experiment there are only four, um, that have a small range of, stim of stimuli, each of them, and the probability to start a new cause here, even though the concentration parameter is small, because of the small size prior, they have a high probability to start a new cluster um, and to reuse an old cluster. So if you think about this kind of behavior, um, this seems like when people encounter different information, they start a new cluster, they don't reuse old clusters, and, but so there's some kind of cognitive inflexibility of not letting something a little bit different uh, uh, fit into an old cluster. So we thought this might be something like maybe a risk factor for depression, this cognitive inflexibility. This is, I'm just, these are hypotheses that have not been tested yet. Whereas in panel B, uh, what you see is a profile that generates, so here we have high concentration parameter and small uh, size prior. So that generates a profile with many small latent causes, 
Um, each explaining information with really limited temporal and spatial range. So this is a kind of very um, uh, creative interpretation of reality, of having lots of different latent causes. So we thought this behavior might be associated with early stages of psychosis, where there is kind of this over creative interpretation and, and lack of coherence and generalization across experiences. Um, in panel C, where we have a large size prior, uh, we see a very small number of latent causes, actually less than the ground truth in the experiment, and very variable experience in each latent cause. So this looks like this high reuse of old causes might be like a tendency for rumination, like we see in anxiety and in depression. Um, so kind of an overly persistent interpretation of experiences in the framework of a few rigidly held schemata. Um, and frequent reuse of them. And the last one in panel D, the, we have behavior that has a low to medium number of clusters and a low probability to start a new cluster when information changes. And so we thought these simulated individuals, uh, they're showing that they're ascribing new information to the wrong latent cause rather than starting a new one. And that might, um, might be related to a vulnerability to post-traumatic stress disorder. So what we're going to do is do a kind of very large-scale testing of this task and, and relate that to dimensions of these diseases and see, um, and, you know, these are a priori hypotheses, but um, we'll, see what, we'll see what we'll get out of this. So, okay, so the very last thing I want to talk about is can we harness this framework to improve treatment. So I talked about how we can maybe use it as a diagnostic framework, but what about treatment? And here, for lack of time, I won't show you, well, I'll just show you the beginning of this movie for anybody who has not seen rats ever. So this is rats undergoing uh, fear conditioning, and we know that you can give rats uh, one foot shock, which they just got here, and um, they learn very quickly to fear uh, the tone that they heard as they got the foot shock. So 24 hours later, when, they'll, when the tone will come on, actually, I'm already showing you the video. Uh, when the tone will come on, they will freeze. So that's the tone came on, and they're freezing. Uh, the movie is continuing. They're just really good at freezing. Um, so this is a kind of memory that we really want to know how to undo, because it can be very maladaptive in cases such as PTSD or phobias. So um, the most straightforward idea is to extinguish the association between the tone and the shock by presenting the tone many times without the shock. Um, and we can do that until the rat stops freezing, but it turns out, and, and many of you already know, that extinction is not robust. So when we test the animal later, it's very easy to reinvigorate the fear of the tone. For instance, if you give a reminder shock to animals, then they freeze again, even if the shock was without the tone. And the same happens if you wait a long time and there's spontaneous recovery, et cetera. So why does extinction not work? So maybe we've been underestimating the rats when we think that they're just learning to associate tones and shocks. And in fact, animals also learn about latent causes. So the tones and shocks in acquisition are obviously very similar to each other and they're all ascribed to one cluster, one latent cause. But then when a new trial comes that's a tone with no shock, the animal can decide whether to put it in that old latent cause. But since it's so different, it might actually start a new latent cause for it. And we talked before about how this protects the old learning from being modified, basically. And so we're not touching that old traumatic memory with this new extinction information. So, our question here is, what if we make extinction more similar to acquisition so we can coax the animal to put the new information in that old memory cluster and change its memory? So we did this with rats, not with humans. Uh, this was uh, Sam Gershman, Marie Monfils' lab, and uh, he uh, gave the rats three tones and shocks in acquisition. And then in extinction, instead of tones without shocks, the first trial was a tone and a shock and then tone with no shock, and then a tone and shock, and two tones with no shock, and tone and shock, and three tones and no shock. So we're basically weaning the rats off the shocks slowly. And we call this gradual extinction. We compared it to regular extinction, which is just no shocks in, um, 
extinction, and also to a condition that we call gradual reverse, which also had five shocks in extinction, but they were kind of things were getting worse over time rather than better over time. And the, the hope was that in gradual extinction, because in the beginning of extinction things are similar enough to acquisition, all this new information would go into that acquisition cluster and slowly dilute it with the un, um, unreinforced or uh, uh, no shock trials. Whereas in regular extinction this wouldn't happen, there would be a new cluster and the old learning uh, would not be diluted with these no shocks. So, we tested, we did two experiments actually. One we tested a day later with a reminder shock that's called reinstatement, and the other we tested 30 days later for spontaneous recovery. And to make the very long story short, it worked. So gradual extinction, uh, rats that underwent gradual extinction, this is between, animal, between animals, did not show any um, recovery of their fear uh, compared to standard extinction and reverse. So I'm out of time, so we'll, you know, I'll leave to you to think about the implications of this for CBT, for prolonged exposure uh, uh, therapies and, of PTSD, and, and in general, what, what we know about how to treat patients. And I'll summarize with the main take-home message, which is that all of learning is generalization. So when we think about learning, really, I think about how boundaries between experiences are set. How do we carve the world into useful task representations? And what I've argued is that the process of reinforcement learning in the basal ganglia uh, that's dopamine dependent and can be so effective and efficient is, is such because we have another process that, that we call representation learning that learns how to cluster things. And, uh, and I talked about frontal parietal, frontal parietal attention network. We also have a lot of other data on orbital frontal cortex storing these states and hippocampus helping to learn them, et cetera. And with respect to mental health, um, these ideas relate to everything from PTSD to schizophrenia, and um, we're just starting to look into that. And, and I love coming to this meeting and hearing all the ideas and learning about the clinical world so that we can make our models more relevant to what patients are actually suffering from. So uh, I'd like to thank my fabulous lab and um, thank you for your attention. Now I'm afraid I went over time, so there's probably no Great. time. Great, I think we have time for uh, one or two quick questions. I've got a question regarding your attention modulated reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. So I think I understood that you modify the values of the stimuli weighted by attention upon uh, when, when learning occurs, but is the attention itself, does it also undergo learning or is that implicit in the it's values? It's a great question. So, so attention does undergo learning. I didn't go into that at, and, and we're that's one of the things that we still don't have a very good understanding of how we learn what to attend to. That's basically the basic question in that experiment. And even though we've been studying it for 10 years, uh, we still have a ways to go. So we know that attention is drawn to high value stimuli. So there is a feedback there between what we learn and how we learn it. Um, but that's not the full story yet. And that's, that's, that's the right question to ask. How do we learn what to attend to? So anyways, in the mathematical model, you don't explicitly have a variable for what the attention is shifted to. No, in that experiment, we just measured it. But now we're trying to predict it. Thanks. One more. Thanks for a great talk, Yale. Thanks, uh, Michael. Can I, I wonder whether um, your clustering task, which sounds like super interesting, whether you could do that separately for the causes of, of nice things and nasty things. because. If, if I can just like make a prediction now, I think in depression, that, that might be the thing that, that gets to it. I think people might treat those different causes yeah. differently. So. That's a great idea. So our microbes are supposed to be kind of neutral, but maybe for people with OC, OCD, that would not be very neutral. Uh, but that, you're, you're right. We should look at negative and positive um, events separately. Thank you. <laughs>